welcome back to the College Football Sports Memo Every Game on the Board podcast with our closer. Last uh, segment here, going game number 197 to the end of the college football card late on Saturday night. Robbie Vino, welcome to the podcast. How are you? How are you today, Drew? I'm doing pretty good. I like that uh, tag of closer for the podcast. That sounds pretty good to me. Yeah? Right. Well, let, let me ask you, if it over under 60 miles an hour right now, a couple warm-ups, could you, could you throw a fastball over 60 miles an hour? Oh, it would be close, Drew. It <laughs> would be close. I might have my arm on ice for the next month if I did. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that'd be a tough ass to get out there and... Uh, to, to, to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball for sure but uh robbie let's start off with some college football here 197 198 texas at texas tech looks like texas in the favorite role hasn't been good for uh coach todd hermit him as a favorite but uh minus one and a half at bet online looks at like minus a two two pretty much everywhere else 62 the total how would you look to bet the uh, red raiders and longhorns here yeah, this is an interesting one, Drew, because all of a sudden, you know, it seems like ever since Tom, Tom Herman has gotten there, his job has gone from, you know, secure to hot seat to secure to hot seat. And in a matter of three weeks, you know, it's gone from secure to hot seat. So it, it, Texas is obviously a fan base that doesn't stand for losing. And the last couple games Texas has played, those are heartbreaking losses. The 38-35 to Oklahoma State. Last week, of course, the 42-41 to where West Virginia goes for two and the win and they get it. So you're talking about two losses by a total of four points. Now they need to bounce back because if they lose in Lubbock, um, some of the articles that we read this week about Tom Herman are going to get even worse and there's a possibility, I think, here for the Longhorns, Drew. It, you know, for Texas Tech, the difference, to me at least, um, the difference between Alan Bowman at quarterback and Jet Duffy at quarterback is like night and day. I, I just don't think that Texas Tech is the same team when Duffy is in there, although he brings an added dimension of being able to uh, run the football. just don't think they operate the same way and with the same efficiency with him at quarterback. So it looks like that's the route it's going this week. Looks like Jeff, Jet Duffy will start here. Last week, of course, they come off the 51-46 shootout loss with Oklahoma. I kind of like Texas here. I think the defense is better. You know, Texas Tech had accumulated a lot of good defensive numbers for about half a season. And then the last couple of weeks, we see all of a sudden Iowa State throws up 40 against them. Oklahoma throws up 51 against them. I think it's because of a lack of depth. Uh, Texas Tech has gotten some better communication. I don't even want to say better athletes out there. I just think they've communicated better out there defensively this year. But they're depth shy. And I think that the season's starting to wear on them a little bit. So with Sam Ellinger back, Texas Tech's pass defense is ripe to be exploited. I'm going to look for Texas in this one, Drew. I know it's tough to go down to Lubbock and grab a victory. But without Bowman, I don't think Texas Tech will win this game. I would look to Texas to stop that two-game losing streak in that one. Price tag, you know, basically you have to win the game here. So, uh Let's see if Texas can do that one time. Yeah, this one, uh, 730 kick on Fox. I think Gus Johnson will be calling it one of my favorite guys, so a fun one to watch there in Lubbock Saturday night. We got 199-200 LSU at Arkansas. Looks like LSU laying 13.5 on the road, 47 the total. You know, for LSU, boy, the schedule has been rough in the fact that this will be the fourth team that they've played that plays LSU off of a bye week. Arkansas has had the extra week to prepare. That's happened three other times to LSU this year. They played Louisiana Tech off of a bye, played Mississippi State off of a bye, played Alabama off of a bye. Of course, LSU had the bye week as well as Alabama did, but four times this season, the team they're going to play has had two weeks to get ready for them. I don't know that it makes that much of a difference here in this game, Drew. Um, For Arkansas, It's been a complete and total upheaval offensively. I'm a big fan of Chad Morris. He's come in and had to really do some pretty decent work just to keep Arkansas afloat here. Talked about it a zillion times that this was one of the biggest transitions on offense from uh, ex-coach to current coach. The difference between Brett Bielema 
and Chad Morris is night and day, certainly. And when you watch Arkansas play, they want to run the football. They do a pretty good job of it against defenses that allow it. But passing-wise, Ty Story, while he's got a pretty good arm from what I've seen of him this year, they don't push it downfield enough to me. And when you let LSU creep up and play closer to the line of scrimmage because they don't respect your deep passing game, that's troublesome for an opposing offense. I don't think Arkansas can stretch them out. Even with the week off, I don't believe it helps. LSU obviously comes off the 29 to nothing loss to Alabama. I don't think they'll be holding their heads, though, Drew. I think they come to play here. LSU and Arkansas for years was a Thanksgiving Day or Thanksgiving weekend rivalry matchup until Mizzou came along into the SEC and claimed that rivalry away from them. Um, So I think LSU will be motivated. I think they come fully focused. Price tag here, 13 and a half, I think, was the last I saw. Uh, I don't think it's that difficult to cover. Arkansas is a mess defensively, and for LSU and Joe Burrow, they won't have to do much aside from hand it off and gain yardage. I think they will do more than that, but they really might not have to do much more than that. Vanderbilt, a couple of weeks ago, made a mess of this Arkansas defense. So uh, week off or not, I don't think Arkansas is a good side here. Yeah, no, good point with, uh, what, four teams are facing off of a bye, although I I think you were kind of alluding to it. It, I think it matters more extra prep time when the, uh, the competition is more comparable, whereas, you know, if this was a, a spread of, say, like a touchdown or less, I would put a lot more emphasis into that. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think LSU is uh, kind of going to manhandle them anyway, so I don't think the extra preparation time matters as much. Do, do you see that as a handicapping angle as well, Robbie? Yeah, I don't think it means any any di- or makes any difference this week, Drew. I just think LSU fundamentally is that much better in all four facets, rush offense, rush defense, against the other side's rush offense and rush defense. So um, I would play them here. I think that 13 and a half, you get away with numbers like this because LSU is just not respected enough offensively to lay bigger numbers. Personally speaking, my uh, power ratings had a pretty big gap here. I have LSU 19 and a half. So you're talking about a touchdown difference here between where the power ratings fall and where the number currently sits. I think that's, you know, although I would never play a game simply based on power ratings, it just helps me to investigate it a little deeper. Um, I think LSU is worth a play here. As we move into the game numbers in the 200s, 201-202, a lot of games here this Saturday, Robbie. Uh, Not a lot of teams on bye week, but we got San Jose State at Utah State, 65 the total. Utah State laying 31. This is a tough ask for uh, the Spartans of San Jose State going into Logan, Utah. It's a tough trip uh, with a way better team. However, uh, laying 30 points is uh, also a tough ask. How do you look to bet this one, Robbie? I tell you what, if Utah State is not everybody's favorite group of five team, then I don't know what they're thinking. Utah State, since I've Watch them second week of the season. They've been about my favorite college football team, and that changes every single year. No affiliation or no bias toward anybody, but just the way they play is sensational. And, of course, they're cashing tickets for me as far as overs are concerned. So um, that's another great reason to like Utah State. But the problem here, Drew, is we don't know the status of quarterback Jordan Love, who took a pretty significant hit last week in that Utah game, and uh, excuse me, in that Hawaii game and actually left in the second quarter. Uh, Richard freshman Henry Columby, who's played quite a bit this season in mop-up duty, came in 9 of 11, 148 yards, touchdown, no interceptions. But to have him start in this game, if that's the way it goes, and ask Utah State to cover 31, I think that would be a little bit dangerous. Uh, I don't know that he brings the same... Uh, rhythm to that offense as Jordan Love does when that Utah State offense is uh, humming and running a play every 11, 12 seconds. They're just so difficult to stop. So much weaponry on that particular side of the football. San Jose State won't be able to stop it. Either way, it's just a matter of how many times uh, Utah State winds up in punt formation here. Normally, I would say go ahead and play them up and over the total because you would expect with Utah State here mid 50s is not too much to ask with their starting quarterback with the backup however if it sinks somewhere to the 42 45 range that they put up in this game mm, might be questionable San Jose State's got some nice 
deep passing ability with Josh Love at quarterback and the set of receivers that they have. Um, but we'll see, Drew. I, for the reason of Jordan Love right now, I'm staying put on this game. If I could get an indication that he's going to go, I probably would get to over 65. That game, by the way, got bumped up this morning total-wise. We had a 64 almost universal, and now we see 65 across the board. So either somebody's guessing that they just let or they just like Utah State period to run up the same amount of points or they're you know some form figuring that Jordan Love is going to play in that contest Robbie next game up we got uh well give me one second here we got App State Texas State App State laying 20 and a half on the road 46 and a half the total you know for Appalachian State it's possible Drew and it looks more than possible now it looks probable that they'll get their quarterback, Zach Thomas, back for this game. Remember a couple of games ago against Georgia Southern, that TV game, he took that hit on their first series, left the contest, didn't return, didn't play last week. Backup Jacob Huseman uh, ran the club, and although they won, the quarterback's numbers were not great in that game. 9 of 19, buck 27, one touchdown, two interceptions. Appalachian State will be very happy to have Zach Thomas back running the show uh, for them here, and you know, it comes at a pretty good time because say what you will about Everett Weathers and Texas State, they've come on uh, toward the end of the season here. They get a 40-31 to 31 victory last week. That came on the heels. We've talked about Texas State quite a bit the last couple of weeks and the way they were able to play defense in that three-game stretch. Um, so I think that uh, Texas State certainly is better than they were a month and a half ago, but if Appalachian State's at full strength here, and Appalachian State is still battling to win uh, uh, their division in the Sun Belt Conference, I see them defensively being able to handle Texas State rather easily. What Texas State was able to do last week, more a product of that Georgia State defense, which is rancid. Um, and I don't, I don't think they're going to do much uh, as far as explosiveness is concerned in this particular contest. I'd look for App State, especially with Thomas back at quarterback, to roll up a big number here. Yeah, the aforementioned uh, Georgia State Panthers on the road against Louisiana Lafayette. We're seeing 69.5 the total with Lafayette laying 14 at home. And, Robbie, uh, you, you bring you just brought up the point of uh, Georgia State's horrid defense. And I'll tell you, I've read a couple articles about the Georgia State Panthers team talking about quit and you know getting rid of some guys. I don't know. There seems to be problems in this Georgia State program. Uh, I don't think 14 is enough here. I'm looking towards Louisiana Lafayette. How do you feel? Yeah, I think you would have to, Drew. Um, I saw head coach Sean Elliott interviewed this week for Georgia State. And, you know, he says all the right things, all the things that a coach should say. Hey, our running game is getting better. But he did say that the run defense, you know, in, in coach speak to say that they have a ways to go still, that means we stink. Um, against the run and you don't want to stink against the run if you're going to play UL Lafayette Trey Regis and those guys because uh, they can do some damage on the ground here averaging 217 rush yards per game they were not able to run the football last week against Troy and they didn't cover they lose 26-16 so for Lafayette it really starts with the running game and then Troy Nunez the quarterback they work in the passing game off of that I think it's something to note here, though, where um, where Lafayette is concerned is they've got a couple of key starters on defense out uh, for this game. So maybe Georgia State can do um, some damage offensively, but their damage offensively, Drew, depends on quarterback Dan Ellington to me. And from what I see, it looks like Ellington might not play in this game. He left uh, last game against Texas State with a concussion. You'll get Aaron Winchester in there. Now, for those who don't know, Aaron Winchester is a guy who's been in the program for a while. I think it's his third year. And so it's not like you're going to a totally green freshman type guy. That's why the total hasn't come down at all. It's actually increased here. I think you see two teams that can put up points. Uh, the minus 14 I think I could get there with UL Lafayette. The 69 and a half could be a good route as well because um, I think you're you're looking at two teams certainly pushing 30 points here. I think the Lafayette side would push uh, over 40 in this one. 
Robbie, interesting handicap here. We got Western Kentucky at FAU. This one in Boca Raton, 58 the total with FAU laying 20, 20 and a half at home. And I'll tell you, Robbie, this FAU team, they go out, pretty much get manhandled by Louisiana Tech, then come back last week and beat FIU, one of the better teams in the conference. I can't figure this team out. I've lost on them twice now. I'm, I'm giving up on uh, FAU. How, how are you looking to bet WKU, FAU on Saturday? Well, a couple of things here. Lane Kiffin was ecstatic with that win last week and was quoted as saying, this is the way we should have been playing all season long. They ran the football right down FIU's throat. 60 carries, 60 rush attempts, 439 rushing yards, 7.3 per pop. Um, Devin Singletary and that running back core made a mockery of the FIU rush defense. But another thing happened along the way there. You know, it, this game was a struggle for three quarters. Uh, it finally got broken open in the fourth quarter when Florida Atlantic put up four touchdowns, win the fourth 28 to nothing. But right before halftime, Kiffin benched starting quarterback Chris Robeson, went to his backup, DeAndre Johnson. Remember, DeAndre Johnson, much ballyhooed, went to Florida State, got thrown out of Florida State for an off-field altercation winds up in the last chance U series in Mississippi comes back to play for Lane Kiffin last year and gets a, a blood disease I think is what it was and had to uh, was hospitalized for a good portion of the year and didn't play last season back on the football field this year as the number two quarterback he enters last week and pretty much sparked this Florida Atlantic team I'd expect to see him as the starting quarterback in this game Drew because as you know, Robeson, as the starting quarterback for Florida Atlantic, has not really produced at all this season. That's been a big problem for the Owls as far as consistency on the offensive side is concerned. If Johnson starts, it looks like, you know, we think it's so late in the season, only two, three games left, and that is true. But teams can turn corners at this point. It's why I often say we have to handicap college football seasons kind of in, into thirds first third middle third and back third i think florida atlantic is one of these teams that might be turning the corner right now defense played sensational last week if the offense can run the football the way they did last week against fiu chances are pretty good they'll run it that way against western kentucky as well for the western kentucky side i had an overplay with them last week against middle tennessee and drew eccles who i didn't expect to start at quarterback it was the last second they they threw him out there to start he's the original starting quarterback for this team and they moved the ball pretty well for a half but couldn't turn it into points and that wound up being their downfall drew we'll see if they turn it into points here um but there's a lot of love for Florida Atlantic right now, line is bumped from 17 all the way up to minus 20. I'd be more inclined to play over. I think uh, Lane Kiffin showed us last week when he feels confident, he's not against running up the score. And he ran it up with a late touchdown to get that game over the total against Florida International. Good stuff, Robbie. We got uh, staying, or staying in the south in the Sun Belt this time. Louisiana Monroe at South Alabama. Louisiana Monroe, man, they came on last week talking about a team that might be bet on down the stretch here if they play like that, like they did against Georgia Southern, putting up, I believe, north of 40 points. But uh, laying seven, six and a half here, 61 and a half the total in uh, Mobile, Alabama on Saturday. Yeah, and I didn't realize, Drew, until I looked this week, that Monroe's actually in first place in their side of the Sunbelt Conference. So they're heading for uh, uh, potentially winning their division. It would require, uh, you know, if they win out, let's put it this way, they're in the driver's seat. If they win out, they'll uh, win that side and go to the Sunbelt Conference Championship game. They need this win to gain bowl eligibility. I think they sit at five for these Sunbelt teams. Bowl eligibility is huge. Um, so a couple of good things working for UL Monroe what's not working for them is two of their three starting linebackers are gone for this game and it's a problem for UL Monroe because they're uh the two linebackers missing Cortez Cisco and Rashad Harding they're the number three and five tacklers on the team in the middle of that defense so you know in all likelihood they can outscore South Alabama but I think that that helps South Alabama's offense quite a bit, having those two missing from ULM, which is not a stellar defense to begin with. You can't be missing your three and five tacklers 
and uh, maintain any sort of, you know, let's call them subpar defense to begin with. They'll fall even further in this game without them. For South Alabama, you've got question marks at quarterback. I think you're going to see redshirt freshmen from everything I've read. Cephas Johnson get the start here because Evan Orth's shoulder isn't good enough for him to throw the football um, from everything I read. So Cephas Johnson is a guy, redshirt freshman, who actually has carried the ball this year more than he's thrown it. How about 18 rush attempts and only six pass attempts, 16 pass attempts? Doesn't mean that that's going to be the way the numbers work this week. I think obviously he'll be able to go to the air. They'll cut him loose a little bit. But I'm um, just interesting that he brings that extra dimension, which again could cause UL Monroe's defense some problems. Minus two linebackers having to play a mobile quarterback could all be problematic for Monroe in this game. Um, it talked about turning corners at the end of the season just a little bit before. Interesting, if you go read a, a little bit about South Alabama this week, you'll find them almost in champ form uh, as a group pushing this uh, motive to win a game starting right here and begin a tradition of winning under first-year head coach Steve Campbell. From the head coach down to the players, they're playing this game like it's a must that they have to win it to start a tradition. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to. I'm just giving you their mindset as a team that's completely out of everything. With only three games left in the season, some teams roll over and quit. This team doesn't appear to be one of them. They look to uh, be all in on winning a football game here starting this week. They're going to, like a lot of teams uh, at this time of year, Drew, they're going to start to push that new freshman redshirt rule. USA is going to let a lot of players out on the field this week so they can see what they have. That's going to happen in a lot of instances across the country because you get four games out of these kids now uh, as freshmen and with only three left, it looks like Campbell's going to be spotting freshmen, uh, true freshmen in and out of this one. And I, I see both of these teams. I think Caleb Evans and company will have a field day against a South Alabama defense that's been no good all year long. But I think with the problems I listed earlier that UL Monroe might have on defense, I think Cephas Johnson and company can score a few here too. 62 is the total. That's where I'm headed with this. I think you can get yourself an over. I'd expect this one to get, you know, mid 60s, 64 to 66 range um, and without much problem. And that puts you right up over the total. Robbie, that's an interesting uh, concept because this is the first year of the new redshirt rule. So I'm just thinking put a new, you know, true freshman playing high school football last year out there on the field. How do you think that's going to affect college football betting from prior years? Would you look to bet overs, unders? I mean, it, how would you go about that? Yeah, I mean, you have to get involved uh, and know each individual situation. With South Alabama, they came out and announced it. I'm sure it's going to go on in a lot of places. You know, with a team like Connecticut, Drew, I don't think it matters because they've been playing true freshmen and a bunch of them since week one. And they've just taken their lumps all the way through. But some of these teams that have held on to these red shirt tags waiting for the end of the season where they could get them to play three full games – and be able to maintain them as freshmen next year. Um, you know, it's an interesting spot. We'll see if it causes, uh, you would think that had putting kids out there at this time of year would cause a little bit more confusion, especially defensively communication breakdowns, so on and so forth. So uh, again, individual situations, I think with South Alabama here, it probably will. It's a bad defense that could maybe get a little bit worse uh, offensively, they haven't been great. I don't know that having freshmen out there could really hurt them if they, you know, you know, have a couple of talented kids that they need to use. Right. Let's move on down the card. We got Rice at Louisiana Tech, fifty-two the total with Tech laying twenty-four and a half at home. Yeah, I think this could be an absolute blowout, Drew. Um, yeah. You know, poor Rice, and we've talked about them and a couple other teams that have had to play since August twenty-fifth. But Rice's defensive numbers have just gotten worse <clears throat> as the season goes on. Last week, when you give up 410 yards to UTEP, it, that's an accomplishment of bad sorts. Uh, and 410 yards, 34 points to UTEP. Dana Dimmel's team finally gets on the board with a win. At this point in time, head coach Bloomgren's team can't stop anybody. They're certainly not going to stop Louisiana Tech. And Louisiana Tech has one of the best, if not the best, defense in 
Conference USA. They come off a thorough beating last week against Mississippi State. Imagine being a, you know, the quarterback of La Tech, Jamar Smith, uh, and you play Mississippi State and you get absolutely manhandled by that defensive front, which is one of the nation's elite. And then you come play Rice. This is going to be, um, you know, like playing against a Pop Warner type team. So. They figure Louisiana Tech, they haven't scored a bunch of points this year, Drew. Offensively, they've been very, very methodical as far as yardage and points are scored. Um, but this particular instance against Rice, I could see a 40-plus being put on to, on Rice here. And with the way Louisiana Tech plays defense, I don't see Rice fighting back much. It's a big, big number, but there's no way in the world I want to take it with Rice. Robbie, we just talked about uh, FIU just a minute ago. They're having to lay 10 on the road here at UTSA. UTSA, not all that, not all great shakes, but the way uh, FIU kind of got ran against there, I, I'm a little worried to lay 10 on the road, like doubles on the road here. Um, how would you look to bet FIU UTSA? Well, if we take a real good look at Texas San Antonio's defense, which has been, you know, the one. I don't even want to call it a bright spot, but let's say it's been their best position unit so far this season because the offense has been so terrible. If we look at their defense, to me, <clears throat> that defense at this time of year, it's starting to erode. They give up uh, three weeks ago, okay, because they had a buy-in between their last two games, but they give up 487 yards to Southern Miss, which is not a great offensive football team uh, this season. And then they come back last week, against UAB, which is a, maybe the best team in Conference USA this year. But UAB goes into that game, Drew, without their starting quarterback. A.J. Erdley doesn't play. He's got a shoulder injury, and they start redshirt freshman named Tyler Johnston the third. All he does is lead UAB to 52 points and 668 yards against this Texas San Antonio defense, which is really – as, as they're constructed, supposed to be their anchor. So then I dug a little farther and looked at these defensive numbers San Antonio's put up this year, and they're phony. They're skewed. They played real good defense against Texas State, held them to 248 yards. Real good defense against Texas El Paso, held them to 297 yards. Real good defense against Rice. You get the point here. Every lousy offensive team that you can find in Conference USA, Texas San Antonio held down. But when they had to play real teams with real offenses, they got drilled. Arizona State put up over 500. Baylor put up nearly 500. Like I say, UAB with a backup quarterback puts up 668. Um, FIU should come in here, James Morgan and company, and be a little bit embarrassed off of what happened last week and light up the scoreboard against a team that can't fight back offensively for Texas San Antonio. Points have been few and far between all season long. The last five games they've played, uh, four of them have been 20 points scored or less. FIU is good enough defensively. You just have to worry, Drew, I think. Beyond the fundamentals, you would worry about the situational mindset of Florida International in this game. Are they going to hang their heads because they thought last week was their chance to get revenge on Lane Kiffin? Or are they going to come in here and play hard? I'll say this. There's still an opportunity for them to win that division, uh, the East Division in Conference USA. Right now they sit tied in the loss column with Middle Tennessee. But Middle Tennessee is going to have to play UAB to close the season. So if FIU could win out, they could win the East and go to the Conference USA Championship game. I think that'll be all the motivation they need to uh, go ahead and steamroll Texas San Antonio here. Guys, we've got a few games left, but uh, remember the coupon code VINO40 at checkout. That's V-E-N-O-4-0, no spaces, all capitals, at checkout for 40% off any all-access pass with Robbie Vino on sportsmemo.com. That's three-day, seven-day, 30-day, 90-day, whatever. Vino40 at checkout for 40% off. Robbie, a big game here. Or, eh, I don't know if I'd say big game. <laughs> FSU at Notre Dame, uh, 51 the total, with the Irish laying 15 and a half at home. Although uh, some quarterback news here, the uh, Notre Dame quarterback is is uh, what not going to play or, or or not likely to play. Robbie, what what do you have on this game? Yeah, Ian Book is out. They're going to go back to Brandon Wimbush, uh, who they started the season with. Of course, the better running option than throwing option. That's why Brian Kelly made the switch way back in the uh, Wake Forest game late September. 
But there was a switch on the other side too, Drew, and you tell me what you think of this because Willie Taggart gave up play calling duties this week, gave him over to Walt Bell, his offensive coordinator. Um, Certainly Florida State has not resembled the type of offense that Willie Taggart has had uh, the last few years, whether it be at South Florida or at Oregon. They've run a lot of plays, but it hasn't produced very many points, only 23.8 per game, which is well below what Taggart would expect well below what Florida State expects, but um, handing over the play calling duties to Bell, we'll see what he can do with it. Walt Bell, a very well respected offensive mind in college football, quarterbacks coach for this team. He's been a successful quarterbacks coach in a lot of places. Um, game uh, game day play calling duties, the switchover. We've seen it happen a couple of years. I'll get your opinion. You think it helps FSU any here against Notre Dame? Absolutely, 100%. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, one, it can't hurt. I, I, I'm Robbie. I'm not a big fan of head coaches calling plays. I think that they have too much going on, too much to worry about, with everything to the program and all the game time decisions. I like it when the offensive coordinator calls plays. And in, in this particular situation, Walt Bell, you just touched on it. I mean, he's one of the great minds, offensive young minds in the game. I mean, the, the Maryland offense, like last year when it kind of had its come out party, that was him as the offensive coordinator. And, Robbie, I know you know it, at Arkansas State, when they were covering those spreads and hitting those overs, it was him calling the plays with, uh, what, Freddie Knight and company in, in the heyday of Arkansas State dominating the Sun Belt. He had a lot to do with that. So I I think it's huge for him and for the Florida State program. Um, I mean, their quarterback situation, though, is, is kind of dire here. I, I can't believe they don't have more talent at it. I don't think Francois can really throw the deep ball, so I don't like him at the quarterback position. And Blackman, what, he's only a redshirt freshman. I mean, he's, he's what, 180 pounds out there running around. I just I think they're kind of dire in, in terms of talent at the quarterback position, so I don't know how much he's going to be able to help, although I do think he helps. Um, I, I'm not sure if, if that answered what you were asking, though. No, I, I think you're right on with that, Drew. Some of these head coaches get so stubborn, and then they finally have to hand over the play. Remember Gus Malzahn handing it over to Rhett Lashley a couple of years back, and all of a sudden Auburn took off offensively, and then Rhett Lashley you know, moved on to UConn, and now he's back at SMU calling plays there so I, I'm with you I think the offensive coordinator is a spot to go I'm also with you on the quarterback situation and we know that Willie Taggart's offense far different than what Jimbo Fisher had there so Willie Taggart walked into a cupboard of talent that wasn't really suited to run his Gulf Coast style um, offense but uh, I don't think turning things over to Walt Bell makes it any worse i think it's a positive in every way shape and form we'll see what they can do against a notre dame defense that's been good all season long bigger question might be brandon wimbush here um boy he took his demotion very very well uh mature guy to sit behind ian book and watch the last six weeks but now he gets another chance to hit the field i don't think his throwing accuracy improves any in this game but florida state just came off a game where they got uh, really shellacked by NC State, gave up 47 points. Um, To me, it's a difficult spot to play uh, sidewise, but I think that the total, Drew, even with Wimbush at quarterback, might be heading over here. Uh, Florida State, I think, can be a little more productive with Bell calling the plays, and I think Notre Dame, uh, Florida State's lucky they learned early in the week Well, I should rephrase that. They're not lucky because they're learning towards the back end of the week that they have to go ahead and face Wimbush now. Um, It's a whole different game plan when you're facing him. So we'll see how that goes. But if I had to look in this game, I'd probably look over. And a lot of times, Robbie, you know, especially at the college level, when a starting quarterback goes out and watches another guy perform well from the sideline, if he gets another shot, a lot of times I've noticed they'll play better. You know, it's it's almost like you see a guy – do the job the way it needs to be done and then and then you kind of get a little I, I don't know what it is maybe just seeing seeing it happen and and you play better yourself have you seen that as well yeah I think it's especially in this case where you take a former uh, starter it was Wimbush's job last year Wimbush's job this year and all of a sudden it's not his job anymore he could have gone the route of let's say Kelly Bryant 
and said, enough of this, I'm transferring out. But he sat there. And um, I think it was, like I say, a real mature move out of him. And uh, I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to get back on the field. So I think we'll see him. We've seen him when he was paired with Josh Adams last year as the running back really run uh, through some gaping holes and for some big, big gains. So we may see that again here against Florida State in this one. Good stuff. Good breakdown there with FSU Notre Dame. Robbie, we got a few more games. Southern Miss at UAB. Looks like 47 the total with the Blazers laying 12 in Birmingham. Yeah, two really, really good defenses here. Alabama-Birmingham, obviously the superior one inside Conference USA, but let's not sell Southern Miss short on what they've done defensively so far this season. I mean, you wouldn't think of Southern Miss, Drew, as a team that's plus 40 net point differential on the season, but they are. And the reason why you wouldn't think it is because they don't score any points, but they don't give any up either. Only giving up 20 points per game, about 20 and a half per game here. Um, beat Marshall last week, 26-24. I think it'll be a good test for the UAB offense, which we'll see. If A.J. Erdely plays here or if one more time we get the backup quarterback for UAB off of last week's results, you would say probably not much problem if you have UAB with a backup quarterback here. I mean, 668 total yards is a huge number for a backup to uh, accomplish. But Southern Miss is not that kind of defense. I don't think they're going to let that happen here. Um, To me, it looks like a game where and as we've talked all season long on podcasts, We find very, very few of these instances where you can see a game totaled in the 40s and actually say, you know, I kind of like the under, even though it's in the low 40s or mid 40s. I think that's the way I lean here. UAB just does not give up points, period. So I can't see Southern Miss exceeding 13 here. And for UAB, you know, 27-13 just seems like a legit final score in this one. So I'd look under. Robbie, uh, let's head to the Big Ten. We got Ohio State at Michigan State. Ohio State laying three and a half on the road in East Lansing, 52 the total. Um, Robbie, I guess just my, my quick two cents on this is Michigan State, the defense looked really well against, uh, looked really good against Maryland, but they can stop the run, and when you can stop the run against Maryland, you stop Maryland, whereas Ohio State, uh, they, they throw the ball down the field a little bit, uh, a lot more than Maryland does. Uh, Haskins, what leads the nation in, in touchdown passes, I believe, and and uh, is is one of the the most in terms of the analytics of throwing the ball down the field. So I think this is a whole different profile to ask. I think this number is actually short. I know it's kind of a square play here, but I would look for for Ohio State to kind of uh, kind of take it to Michigan State, the more talented team, and lay the short number. How, how do you feel about this one in the Big Ten? Yeah, I could reiterate everything you just said because I would have said it myself if you didn't. Um, Michigan State's pass defense has not been good this season, Drew, and it takes a couple of games um, against teams like Maryland in order to even make those pass defense numbers, even able to swallow those numbers. You know what I mean? Like they give up 253 yards a game right now, and that's – including the fact that they only allowed 74 to Maryland. I've said it all year long. If Maryland can't run, Maryland can't win. It happened again last week. The difference between Michigan State's rush defense and their pass defense is night and day. And although Ohio State is coming from the other angle, Ohio State, you've seen Urban Meyer for five weeks now get up in his Monday press conference and say, we need to run the ball better. They've got really good backs. The offensive line has failed them this year as far as the run game is concerned. But they want to run. They want to run. They want to run. And in the end, they have to put it back on Haskins' shoulders and throw. It's not going to be that bad to go out there this week and let Haskins take it on his shoulders and let him throw. Um, like you said, it's a totally different profile here. I agree with you. I like Ohio State. Um, if we want to call it a square play, we'll call it a square play. But they cash too. Um, So I don't see any reason why Ohio State wouldn't be the right side here. Michigan State, let's not forget that they're dealing with a quarterback, a starting quarterback in Brian Lewerke, who when you watch him play, even last week in victory against Maryland, you watch him play, it's noticeable how much that throwing shoulder hurts him right now. So they're not getting good quarterback play. Ohio State's defense might be boosted by the fact that Lewerke's been injured now for Two games heading into his third game with this shoulder injury. 
Rocky Lombardi started a couple of weeks ago, the backup. We may see him here. He threw it around a lot, a little bit. If he plays, we might be headed for a higher scoring affair because both sides would score at that point. But um, I think if Lewerke's the starter here, Ohio State's the play. I think if Lombardi's the starter, over becomes the play. We'll keep a close eye on it. But from everything I see, it looks like Brian Lewerke, the uh, starter, is going to get the nod here. And to me, that spells Ohio State uh, in this contest. Right. We have two games left, but I want to go off, kind of off the board here, something we haven't done yet. I, I think Teddy had this game, and I brought this up with him. It, it was Maryland-Indiana. I want to ask you real quick, because I know you have had a beat on Maryland. And it's an interesting you know, handicap all season long, not only the coaching aspect, but being able to stop the run. Do you think um, Indiana has a chance to stop their run, or do you like Maryland here plus the two points? Well, I immediately went... When I first went over the numbers Sunday, Drew, and put a check mark next to the over in this contest. Now, Indiana's got a better run defense than um, some teams do. But I'm trying to remember the comparison I used yesterday with a passing team. But I'll say this. If you're a middle-of-the-road run defense, which I think Indiana is, they're not superb and they're not awful. They're middle-of-the-road. Then I think Maryland wins that battle. So I would say in this game, my interpretation of this opponent is that Maryland can run the football on Indiana and that's why I had over checked um, because Indiana will do some damage of their own on offense against Maryland so it, that's just the way I read this and I know there's another team and I can't think of it off the top of my head that I use the same exact you know <laughs> scientific mathematics I guess yeah. um, to, to gauge them but yeah I would say that Maryland's going to be successful here running the football. They're an exceptional running team, but when they run into exceptional run defenses, they just aren't good enough because they have no threat of throwing the football. Kasim Hill just hasn't gotten it done all season long. But they'll run on Indiana. I'm pretty convinced of that. All right, guys. Sorry about going out of order there. We got we, I, I probably got to watch myself doing that, confusing people. But uh, two games left, 2-2-1, 2-2-2. UCLA at Arizona State, 62 the total with ASU. The Sun Devils land 13 and a half in Tempe. Everybody who laughed at Herm Edwards being hired, raise your hand, right, Drew? I mean, a six and three against the spread. And 99% of us didn't think that it was a good hire. It's turned out to be a really good hire. Um, you know, Kevin Sumlin. The head coach of the other big team in the state hasn't had as good of a year, although they're turning it on now with the health of their quarterback, Khalil Tate, rounding near 100%. But for Herm Edwards, a 6-3 and three spread season, fantastic with three games left, um, a chance to win the South Division of the Pac-12, and he'll be going against Chip Kelly's team full of rookies out here for UCLA. They, especially defensively, Drew, they just haven't, been there all season long they've shown some sparks on offense at times last week 496 yards against Oregon um, is, is a real good number so I'd give their offense a little bit more credit than I do their defense Arizona State comes with constant pressure I think they're a pretty good side here I don't see UCLA going on the road and putting up those type of offensive numbers that they did last week against Oregon um, here in this contest against Arizona State Arizona State was a lot to play for I think Herm Edwards if nothing else he's a motivator and a guy who can get in these kids heads and kind of keep them level keep them grounded for this contest you would worry about a team that might read the press clippings, hey, we're in first place, hey, we can win the Pac-12 South and, you know, kind of go out on the field and flop. But in this instance, I don't think that's going to happen. I think you'll see a pretty good effort out of Arizona State. They've got three big guns, at quarterback, running back, and wide receiver that can take advantage of UCLA. Um, for me, it would be Arizona State in this game or nothing. Guys, remember the coupon code. we got one game left. Uh, Vino40 at checkout, 40% off any all-access with Robbie Vino. That coupon code is Vino, V-E-N-O, 40 at checkout. Get back game, degenerate special, whatever you want to call it, Robbie. UNLV at San Diego State, 53.5 the total with, uh, looks like SDSU laying 23, 23.5, seeing some 22.5, so some opinion on this one. But uh, either way, Mountain West Affair, how do you look to bet it late night, Saturday night? Yeah, the increase in San Diego State, as far as the point spread's concerned, was kind of head-scratching because Armani Rogers, the quarterback for UNLV, is cleared to play now. You know, last week I think he was cleared as well, 
but they were preca- uh, for took precautionary measures and didn't play him. Max Gilliam was out there in their new pass style offense. They do have to go back now if Rodgers becomes the starter here. Go back to what they were doing so successfully the first six weeks of the season in that run oriented offense with Rodgers and Lexington Thomas. Um, so for me, if Rodgers is going to play, that's kind of strange at San Diego State, a team that just doesn't cover double digits. We talk about it time and time again, and they failed again last week. Even with the return of Christian Chapman, their quarterback, he entered the game in the second quarter, engineered a late fourth quarter comeback because they're losing to New Mexico in the fourth quarter. Number one running back Juwan Washington came back in that game, performed real well. I think he had uh, near seven or over seven yards per carry in that contest. So they're healthy again offensively. But you don't want to ask San Diego State. I don't care who the opposing defense is because the the point, very rightfully so, would be brought up that UNLV's defense is horrible. And the discrepancy there might be enough to cover this type of number in the 20s. But I don't think it's the case with San Diego State. Boy, they just don't cover double-digit numbers because Rocky Long's offense isn't designed to do so. They milk clock. Um, That's their their whole deal is to just be methodical, milk clock, let the defense win it. They'll get the 35, and that'll be enough for them. If Rodgers plays, getting to 14 here isn't too much to ask. So I'm a little surprised people have run towards the San Diego State side in this contest. Um... I think UNLV plus all those points could be the right side here. Yeah, I agree with you. One, the, the Gilliam kid, I, I don't think he's you know as good in, in the dynamic that Rodgers brings, but he has gotten a little better. I know last game out he kind of flundered, but the, the, the games leading up to that, he, he was a little bit more on point. And if, if Rodgers plays, I mean, he's their best player. So uh, I, I, I would look to bet UNLV as well, especially uh, maybe late on Saturday, uh, the, the late night game, if you, if you need something on it. Uh, watch the watch the warm-ups. If, if Rodgers is out there, maybe look to bet on it. Do, do you have that kind of betting angle on this as well, Robbie? I would. You know what I would do, Drew? I would go out. I'd find a few degenerates to sit with and take <laughs> UNLV and try and, you know, capitalize on the late game. I do think, all kidding aside, that, you know, it, it just is a little strange that, that, that the number would run up with San Diego State, not a known a known offender as far as covering big point spreads are concerned and um just the fact that having rogers back in the lineup should produce for them so and we'll see what happens here if if gilliam plays we can't fault him for everything drew because unlv had to change their entire offensive scheme once rogers went down they went from a run oriented offense to a pass oriented offense now back to a run oriented offense with rogers um and i think that plus those points it, it would be worth taking All right, good stuff, Robbie. Guys, remember the coupon code VINO40, and we're going to have Rob back on for the NFL Every Game on the Board podcast tomorrow with Teddy Covers. We'll, uh, We'll see you then, and best of luck with your bets tonight.